I'm the VP of Engineering at a company called Condé Nast. Uh, I'll go on in a minute a little bit about what they do. I've been doing chaos engineering for quite a long time. Um, and yeah, I'm going to share some of my experiences with you, but also like where do we think chaos is going to evolve to in the future? Um, and how can we pull things from resilience engineering in into our learnings and practically apply them on a day-to-day -day basis? So this is um, one of my favorite books um, that talks about human factors, system safety, resilience engineering. Um, and the, the person who wrote this book was Sidney Decker. He was actually an airline pilot um, and also a, um, uh, uh, somebody who's involved in human factors and safety, system safety. And the, the quote is, complexity doesn't allow us to think in linear, unidirectional terms along which progress or regress can be plotted. So just for a minute there, just have a think, like, when we get on in a minute about root cause analysis and how, you know, in this book it talks about, like, uh, we have socio-technical systems. There are a lot of parts to it. It's not just about the systems that we build, but it's also about the organizations in which we work, the factors that set outside of that, which have constraints on us and push us in different directions, you know, our management. There are lots of different factors to this. But also, like, when we think about root cause, it, it often pushes us in this very linear direction of trying to find a single point of failure, which is probably a wrong way of thinking of it as well. I mean, given our systems and networks, it's very unlikely that there is a single root cause. But yes, go read this book, it's amazing. So I work at a company called Condé Nast. Often I get the question of what is Condé Nast? Um, he was actually the owner of the company. The company itself is 120 years old. Um, it was a publishing company, um, you know, doing things from printing press, and now we're doing the whole digital transformation journey. Um, and you'll know a lot of these titles. I suppose Wired is a key one. It's, we do actually have a couple of technical brands in our portfolio, but there's about 60 brands. And just to give you a, a sense of the scale at which we run, sorry if this like, induces any kind of epilepsy, by the way. Uh, I, th I do think it's quite a beautiful graphic, but it's kind of quite much. But as you can see, we, 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 we are a global company. Uh, and we do have, you know, 500 million or so uh, visitors per month across, our, across the globe. Um, and, you know, uh, I think Dave mentioned a one-hour latency. We well, can imagine the kind of latency that we have to deal with on a human scale, which is, you know, if I want to talk to my team in Japan, the Japanese engineering team, that's a 12-hour time zone difference, so it is very challenging. Sometimes, you know, uh, resolving something can take a week because of the, the, the amount of latency that we have. Um, we are running on Kubernetes. Uh, we use mainly AWS. We use some GCP for, like, the data pipelines and data warehousing. Um, we are also running in very challenging countries like Russia and China. Uh, we do have other um, CDN providers there. We're able to use AWS for now, but it's likely we'll be swapping to a multi-CDN, uh, multi-cloud environment, and that's why we chose actually to use Kubernetes in the first place. Um, it's mainly Node, React, and um, JavaScript is the stack as well, and we use Fastly CDN in most places, which I think is also a, you know, a really amazing CDN. So, uh, my talk was about trying to identify unknown unknowns, right? So I wanted to try and like, talk to you about like, what does this mean? So a lot of you probably have seen this before. So we have things that in the middle we have disorder, but there are different, this, qu this quadrant kind of shows, okay, we have the very complex, which is the unknown unknowns. We have things which are complicated, which are known unknowns. We have things that are chaotic, which are unknowables. And we have things that are simple, which are known knowns. And kind of going through this, so I think Dave mentioned this morning again, like unknown unknowns are like the emergent practice. Like our systems, our architectures, even the way that people behave within the system are always changing, so the properties will be emergent. Good practice is more in the complicated space. And like what I would say there is like maybe you could leverage something like run books or playbooks in this space. But playbooks and runbooks will only get you so far. That they can only, you can only use them so, so much in terms of like uh, disaster recovery. Um, chaotic is more like novel practice. And what they say here is like, a lot of that's like tacit, implicit knowledge. 
Um, not to invest too much energy in that because it's, it's extremely unlikely that you would get much value from it. And simple is best practice. So this is where you might have documentation, right? Or do your tests, right? This is how I feel about this quadrant anyway in terms of what we do. So what can we do to kind of experiment effectively? So there was a keynote speaker here last year, Adrian Cockroft, who's the VP of Cloud Architecture at AWS, and he showed this diagram, and I love this diagram. I show it a lot in my talks, but I think this is a really interesting way of thinking of it as well. We have multiple layers, and this is, I appreciate quite a simplified example, but still multiple layers in terms of how we would want to perform chaos engineering and how you know we have people involved in this as well, and that's where you get things like game days. There are more tools becoming available out there. I think it's a shame that some of the bigger companies are deciding to close source rather than open source some of their tools. Um, but there, there is quite a lot more out there today than, than what was represented here last year. Um, so, I don't know, I think there are a couple of uh, Dungeons and Dragons fans. You might recognize the, the dice. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Um, but this is, this is what you would do, right, if, if you're going to perform chaos, is you would define a steady state in your control groups. You'd form your hypothesis, you'd run an experiment, you'd verify the results, you'd tweak them in some way, you might run them again. That sounds pretty straightforward, but what about, how, how, do, you, how do you even define the steady state? Because let's, let's think about our architectures for a minute and how they have evolved recently as well. So here we have the good old LAMP stack, which is perfectly fine. I think a few people have talked about monoliths today, and I think a lot of us probably still have monoliths somewhere in our organization, if not completely. But you know, it was quite a simple time, really. You know, it's like we had you know, the, app the application or a set of applications running on a single database, or you know, maybe a, a database with, with other backups. We had you know, a, a server, a web application, it was very, you know, it was much more easy times then. That's not the case, you know, today as well. And what I'd say as well is, like, I think there's been a bit of hate on PHP today. I spent most of my years uh, as an engineer writing PHP. I don't think it's, it's terrible, but I think, like, it probably still runs 80% of the internet, and 70% of that's probably WordPress. So, like, microservices are great and all, but we're, we're still getting there. Um, and PHP isn't bad. Um, so what, how have we evolved recently? So, you know, even as far back as five years ago, as 10 years ago, we were doing things more on physical machines. A lot of us talked about bare metal today, still running things in data center. That's very much my case now as well, is that, you know, my teams in London tend to do a lot of things, you know, cloud first principles, cloud native. But, you know, I, I look after 11 teams, 12 teams, in fact, globally, and they're running this you know, across data centers and cloud as well. So it's a whole mix of things. And of course, maturity as well. There's a ton of legacy there that needs to be dealt with as well. So we have the units of scale here as well um, in terms of like physical servers going up to machines, virtual machines, then you know, applications and containers, um, but even serverless, which isn't exactly serverless. It's just somebody else's servers, but we won't talk about that. Uh, and like the, the way that we can spin these up really quickly now. And in serverless, it's like, it's a different paradigm. We still have to care about that, but we need to think about these different kind of properties and characteristics of our architecture when we're designing our, our chaos experiments. So this is a, a view of our current um, microservices architecture. And I just wanna say one thing as well about architecture. Like, it's never a static thing, right? I think we're always on the path of migration with architecture as well. Like once you know, we get to the end of this microservices approach, I'm sure we'll be already migrating to some other um, architectural paradigm. And normally in our businesses as well, we have multiple different architectures running in tandem. It's not this one usually, unless you're maybe a really early stage startup. You know, if you have some amount of maturity and legacy, there will be multiple different paradigms. So we started moving you know, to this uh, microservices approach from a service-oriented approach about sort of 18 months ago. And at the minute we have, uh, this is a, a slightly old picture, but we have now about 40 or 50 microservices uh, running. 
And I was just going to point out as well, this is taken from Datadog, so I do quite like their APM, which gives you this nice trace, this nice trace of the um, architecture. Also, running Kubernetes, we have you know, a service mesh you know, which runs on the control plane, and you know, as you can see, like, it's, it's quite complicated architecture. You've got your services, which are fronted by proxies, which also get configuration from you know, different things, like their TLS certificates, their configuration, and also any other type of data that it needs, basically, for telemetry. And then we have serverless as well, and serverless has lots of different types of paradigms. So you can do things just synchronously, just push. You can do things asynchronously through, you know, um, you know, sort of multiple requests using Lambda functions. Uh, this is quite good for us as well because we have a lot of Node developers, and I think serverless is quite nice for application slash product developers to get used to because it, it fits into paradigms that we're already quite used to in terms of invented architecture. Um, and then you have things like streaming as well. And then again, another like, thing that we have where I work as well, you know, we have a big portfolio of brands that run in multiple markets across the globe. So we decided when we built our platform that we would go multi-tenant as well in terms of web application. And I think a lot of times when I hear people talk about chaos engineering, they focus a lot on the lower levels of the architecture around you know, networking, switching, uh, infrastructure attacks that you can do, but you know there's a lot of complexity in, in the application layers themselves, and even up to the you know right to the edge nodes as well with the CDN caching. Um, we're quite lucky as as a company because as a publisher, our content can have very long TTLs, so we can actually serve stale for quite a long time. But it depends on your company, right? So that's the thing you have to bear in mind: is like what kind of you know what kind of products are, do you have? What kind of needs do your customers have? You know, an e-commerce business would have a very different set of needs in terms of the experiments that they need to run. And recently, we did have a, a platform outage, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But because we've gone for this multi-tenant architecture, which is great in a lot of ways, it actually ended up affecting something like 25 of our websites because of the sort of shared architecture. And then if we go up further the stack, so micro, micro front ends is taking on you know, more of a, sort of a trend uh, uh, at the minute. And this is sort of identifying how can we use something like a server side approach like microservices and apply it to front ends. And this is something we're starting to do as well where I work. And a lot of big companies are starting to do this as well. But this is, you know, it's becoming like the complexities on both sides. It's on the client, it's on the server. Uh, and we can't keep ignoring this as well. So I think somebody asked a really good question at one of the most recent um, events I was at, which was Chaos Community Day in London, and they said, how do you chaos test uh, front-end, like your front-end architecture? And, and it got me thinking, like, I don't, I don't think that this question comes off often enough or that people are talking about this often enough. But at the minute, yeah, as you can see, there are a lot of JavaScript frameworks which already do this. So I'm just going to tell a quick story about a, a platform outage that we had at work. This is quite recent. I think this was in late August. We, had, we do have outages, uh, of course, like everyone. Um, but it, I think it's just interesting. To, I don't tend to go into Slack and follow people when it's happening, but I always love to go back and like, review what, what actually happened uh, and just see like, how, how do people react and like, how do they figure out like, tacitly this knowledge they have in their heads like how did they work this out, and like who's playing what role as the thing's unfolding? And as you can see, like somebody's suddenly saying, "Oh, I'm starting to see DNS errors." Well, for a start, like hopefully, like we'd have some alerting in place that would have told us for, told us that first. But we all know in practice that doesn't always happen. And then we started seeing this error 503 actually coming into the browser, which is really bad user experience. And this was affecting again, like I said before, 25 of, of the sites that we run. And it was kind of intermittent, which is always the best kind of failure, right? Um, and then you can start to see, like, people are saying, okay, well, it only affects 8.5% of the requests. Some of them are 404, some are 503, uh, and they keep going through, like, okay, let's see. They can see gradual ramp up. Uh, somebody identified that it started two hours before anyone started talking about it in Slack. <laughs> And, and then we you know, move it over to an incident room. So we, like you would do with an incident process, we move it to an incident room so that people can go in there and not cloud up a, another channel with, with this conversation. 
Um, so yeah, carries on. I was, one thing I wanted to point out is this person, like, you know how incidents go? Like, this, this guy's on holiday, but he still decided to go in there and have a look. It's like, we're like moths to a flame when there's an incident. It's like, oh, it's quite exciting. Gonna jump in there and help, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of also causes more chaos as well. Uh, so, you know, we kind of, somebody actually wrote here, hypothesis, here's a hypothesis of what's going wrong. Uh, sort of like an out of memory, a crash is happening. Uh, turns out they weren't that far wrong. Um, and so, yeah, we started, yeah, different things were tried. But in the end, like, one of the things that we found is that um, Kubernetes can be a bit too, it can make too many requests for, for things, and I, I don't know fully what happened, but it sounds like it was making some, when it should have been making two requests, it was actually making about 15 to 20 requests, and it was doing this also on IPv4 and IPv6, so it was making like 10, 10 sets of requests on both, on both, basically, each time it needed to make a single request, and it just saturated DNS, and it just totally screwed up everything. But anyway, so, yeah, it's like, I think in that scenario, it, was like it, took, it took quite a long time for people to play that out and to figure out where is the failure. But also, like, was it a single thing as well? So I'll come on to that in a minute. Like, how, do, how do we identify actions? Because, you know, as you can see, people are trying to work out what's going on. They're using graphs. Um, you know, some people are, are sort of suggesting what it could be. People are probably looking you know, through you know, SSH and trying different commands to figure out what's going on, you know, directly on the, on the machines themselves. Um, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Like, what kind of actions can you play out and how you can roll those into your experiments? So there's been quite a lot of talk about tracing today, which is great. Um, it's something I'm seeing, like, more and more people pick up. And I'd say, like, in terms of, like, if you're gonna run chaos experiments, you need to make sure that you're instrumenting your observability practices and things like tracing. Like, it's, it's, just, it's not something that's a nice to have, it's a must have. Like, please do not <laughs> go and run chaos experiments if you don't have the observability to kind of back that up. You'll find your gaps, because there will be gaps, but like, just don't go in there and start breaking stuff and being like, ah, oh, shit, I don't know actually what happened, but yeah, you're breaking stuff, it's cool. But this, this is a really great um, blog post, by the way. It's by, um, a lady called Cindy, Cindy Sridharan. I'd like say like follow her on Twitter. She's amazing. Um, but also she talks about like how to set up observability and distributed systems and how to do like request tracing properly. So observability. I love this tweet, by the way. So yeah, this is how I feel every time I try to figure out what the fuck's going on. <laughs> Um, th yeah, so one thing I noticed recently was during this outage we had, I was going in, so we use Datadog quite a lot. I think Datadog's really amazing, but almost too powerful in some ways. It's almost too easy to create extra dashboards and different monitors. Um, I just remember going in and thinking, I, I don't even know where to start. Like, our dashboard had grown from a set of probably like eight different visual representations of different metrics to 60. <laughs> I was like, where do I look? Um, so yeah, so we have all kinds of stuff, right? So like this, this is not so tricky. This, I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> if somebody can tell me what this is showing me and what this is about, I'd, I'd still love to know. <laughs> I'm hoping that the cloud platform in engineers actually know what's going on. <laughs> But yeah, so there's just, there's just a whole bunch of things here. This, I mean, this is, this is looking you know, a little bit more acceptable. Um, and I, I, I quite love this feature as well. I think somebody showed this earlier, like the flame graphs that you can get as well from, from Datadog in terms of like request tracing. And you can find all the tagging against that as well. Um, so, I don't know if any of you have ever watched Holt and Catch Fire. It's an amazing series. I'd recommend it. It's all about, um, what, what happened in the early days of Silicon Valley and like how startups started. It's not based on a real story, it's kind of a dramatization, but it's, it's a really amazing series, uh, so I recommend going and watching it. And this guy here, he's, he's the product manager. And they're like, ooh, what's a product manager? So it's like quite a, a new concept. But this is one of the quotes that he said during the series. So he said, progress depends on us changing the world to fit us, not the other way around. And I think this is true in terms of our systems. Like, 
you know, we build the systems. We're not, as operators and builders of the systems, we're, you know, somebody said earlier, humans are fallible. That, that is true. But at the same time, we need to be able to mold the systems to fit our requirements and not the other way around, essentially. And just to give you, this, this also is from a recent talk that I gave. So there's um, this concept of the sharp end and the blunt end of the spectrum in terms of what kind of pressures and constraints uh, influence our work and our architectures um, and the outputs that we create as well. And this was created by two people um, which are really big in the field of resilience engineering called Richard Cook and David Woods. So again, please go and read from them. Like they've written a lot of amazing books and white papers. A lot of them are freely accessible on the internet, so do, do go and read them. But so one thing that I like to think about is that there's a lot of outside influences, and we can't often control those, but they're there, right? So for us, you know, things like regulations and regulatory environments is very important when you think about China and Russia. Like, we can't get around that. And, you know, we, we actually tested recently, like, we need to be able to run uh, a multi-region, you know, um, a, a platform with different, you know, Kubernetes clusters, and we tried to send traffic. We just did some rudimentary testing, like we tried to send traffic um, to China, uh, different, different, just basic tests that we could run, but we found that it dropped about 20% of our um, of our packets, which is, you know, high. So then we started thinking, okay, well, what do we need to do here? Because we didn't expect that to happen, and like, do we need to actually set up some sort of direct connect there in order to make that work? Which obviously is more expensive. But we have this we have this issue, and a story I like to tell is the CTO in our China engineering team has been to the police station four times because of things that accidentally got published on the website. So, <laughs> and he acts like it's just no big deal. He's like, yeah, I've been to the police station a few times. But like for me, I'm like, holy shit, like you went to the police station because you published something on your website? Like, but, but yeah, apparently it's just like, it's just what happens there. Anyway, uh, yeah, and then we have all these geopolitical things. And like when you run a global company, like geopolitical things can have a big impact, right? Like it could be like market dynamics in terms of economics as well. Like sometimes we'll see in our markets, like the, the economics itself is crashing uh, and therefore like, you know, it puts existential risk on that part of the company, the brands that exist there as well. And then you have things within your, your company as well, like what is your management like? What's their behaviors and their values? What kind of governments, governance do we have in place? Can we make quick decisions or is it kind of like culture by committee, which can, you know, slow things down? You know, OPEX, CAPEX trade-offs and like pressures there. Um, your cultural norms. You know, are you a blame culture? Is it a blameless culture? How do you deal with accountability? That sort of thing. And management, right? Like, now me as a manager, because I was an engineer for a very long time, it's very difficult. Sometimes I'm lacking a lot of the detail. And it really pains me, like, sometimes to be talking to engineers and feel like I'm really lacking that, that information. But we try to make the decisions that we think are best, but we're often, you know, without all the information that we need. And then us, or sort of you as engineers here, you're at the sharp end, what they call the sharp end of the model. And I think one thing that people talk about is mental models. Like our systems are now so complex. We're not using LAMP stacks in most cases anymore, right? So our, our architectures are so complex that we can't hold them in our heads anymore. We just can't. It's just too, it's too complex. And so, you know, the engineer that sits next to you might have a completely different view of what their mental model of the architecture looks like than you do, or even how the system's designed, what the inputs and outputs are, what the expected behavior is. And this is why things like chaos engineering and doing things like game days are super important. And this, I think also another really key one here is esoteric knowledge. So there is a bit of um, research happening in resilience engineering called cognitive task analysis, um, which is like, how do people know the things that they know? And how do people gain esoteric knowledge in the work that they do? And how can we surface that up so that it becomes knowledge that we can share? Because often that is a very difficult thing to do. But for me, in my company, it's like, you know, when we talk about chaos engineering, it's like, at what cost? And I think Grimland have done quite a good job about talking about quantifying or using proxy metrics 
to kind of quantify what is the risk to your customers in terms of the monetary value, maybe trust is another one. You know, you have to think about what, what kind of customers are we talking about here, internal or external customers as well. And I've written some really like, great blog posts about this. But this is how I try to get sponsorship to do this anyway. And this is how I try to talk to, to my managers and the executive team in terms of getting buy-in. And I have been quite lucky anyway. I know some people here have said that as well. Like, I have been quite lucky. My boss has been quite good at backing me up uh, in order to do this. You know, I had the product director often saying, they don't need any time. We need to just launch on this day. And my boss said, no, just give them, give them the time that they need in order to run their game days to, get, to make sure that they're, they're happy with what they're doing. But yeah, you can talk to me about the long road afterwards, about how to get that. Um, another thing that um, I think is changing and I'd like to see changing more is trying to take an alternative view and direction on postmortems. Um, and there's also, I, I try to put a lot of research and like things that I've read into my talk, by the way, as you might have noticed. But there's a guy called Stephen Shorek, again, a resilience, human factors um, expert who writes really, really well on this topic. And he talks about like work is imagined versus work is done. But there's actually a few more things happening here. So like work is imagined. So we imagine how, you know, in our minds, the work that we do or someone else is doing. There's also the work is prescribed by our managers or by other factors. There's work is disclosed. So like what we might actually mention in terms of what we tell our colleagues, what we document, what goes into a postmortem. And then there's the work that's actually done. So that's that esoteric knowledge that I talked about earlier as well. And like, how do we get that surfaced in a way that it becomes learning for the company? And so what do we do? So we started trying to change the language a little bit and call them like post-incident reviews. Uh, and we actually try to make sure, not only just invite, but just make sure that there's quite a diverse audience that come along to our, to our reviews. And that includes you know, people you know, from the exec team. It can also include um, people, depending on what customers it affects, like you wouldn't normally get outside customers, but we have, you know, commercial teams that we serve, editorial teams that we serve. We create platforms for developers. Um, so we bring along product managers, designers, UXers. It, it just get them in there because they will bring a unique perspective. And also like what's important to the product manager might seem quite at odds with what's important to the developer and trying to, I think what somebody was saying earlier is like bringing business value, you know, it, it depends on whether or not the product manager is actually passing that information on in a way that can be understood and kind of get everybody aligned against a single mission, basically, and what they're doing. So this was actually the, the actions that we wrote up as well. Um, this is taken from, from our document. As you can see, a lot of these are technical fixes. Um, and they're assigned to a team. And a lot of it was around CPU, DNS exhaustion. Um, but also, we, you know, I, I was also observing, and I'm glad that they put this one at the end, because I was thinking, oh, God, I have to put that in there. But, you know, it's like, how did we get to a point where, you know, DNS causes things to throw a 503, and that's what the user sees? Because for me, that's like we're doing... A, you know, we could be doing better probably at like advent, uh, sort of error handling and uh, error sort of bubbling as well. And sort of capturing that before that's what the, the actual um, customer sees. But you need to think beyond like purely technical fixes because that, that's, I mean, that's great, right? And I think that that's really important and you need to be able to go back and actually identify whether or not you actually did that work. But like what else could we do? What else can we do? So. You know, one thing that we tend to do in our game, actually, I'll, I'll tell you a story about the first one we did. We, we actually did role playing for a long time before we actually started actually breaking anything. So we kind of created some dummy scenarios and brought everybody into a room and said, how would you go about fixing this? And the first thing that became pretty apparent is like there were several services that people weren't even aware of. And, you know, like some people knew about them and others didn't. And the way that people would say, this is what I would probably, these are the steps that I would probably take to even identify what's going on. They were all quite different. And it actually taught me something about the culture at that time as well. Because we actually had somebody from the ops team there, and we said, well, what would happen? So it's something about like an image was uh, on the homepage of uh, Vogue.com. Like the, the image wasn't displaying, and instead it was, you know, it was throwing some error. And, and then the person tried to remediate that 
but by doing that, the operator actually made it worse. Uh, and then they took, you know, then they took down the whole site and a couple of other sites as well, given the multi-tenanted architecture. And the person who was kind of doing incident commander said, okay, well, what, what, what will we do? And somebody said, we would fire them. And I thought, no, this is exactly the opposite of the culture I want to create. But it, it, was, it was a good way of like, learning a little bit about the culture at the same time. But yeah, it's like one thing I'd recommend is like doing whiteboarding like during a, a review. Like say to somebody, okay, could you, and if they don't feel comfortable, you can do things like one-to-ones with people and not do it in a room, but it would be good to get to this point where you can say to somebody, okay, can you draw an architecture diagram of the part of the system where you think there might have been part of the failure? And then you get somebody else to do it and you can usually find that actually there are gaps there. And you can say, okay, well maybe what we could do is get them to do a rotation on that team, get them to pair with that team more, find some way of, of bridging that knowledge gap. A really common thing I see as well as incident management processes, like we build this beautiful incident management process, it's got some sort of like flow to it, like kind of um, decision tree flow of like what to do. When it's actually the moment in the moment, uh, I find that often that, that process can break down. And that, or it's like, it's surprising, like the, the way that we designed it, in, in actuality, it, it doesn't flow that well. And we have seen things like where we've forgotten to communicate to the customers in a timely way. And Jed, how do you update that? And this last one is uh, the thing I mentioned before, too many graphs, like to be able to even discern what's going on. There's just too much information. Um, we need to kind of hone in on what's important. And sometimes if you have too much of a wealth of information, it, can, it, becomes, it, it becomes more of a hindrance than a help. Okay, so um, I think a few people have mentioned Casey Rosenthal, who kind of wrote about chaos engineering, set the principles for chaos engineering. And we, this, is a, this isn't one of our pipelines, I took this from the internet, but we do use Circle CI. And Circle CI is really great because it allows development teams, product teams, to create their own pipelines for CI, CD. Um, and so we have a lot of different pipelines, as you can imagine, and different steps to those as well, because they can choose to do what they want. Um, that does create a bit of extra complexity, but one thing that Casey talks about as well is like, can we build in something called continuous verification into our pipelines as well? Like CI CD, CD is great, but like, can we, instead of like trying to um, validate the internals of our architecture, can we actually verify the inputs and outputs that we expect on a continuous basis and even run our experiments through that pipeline continuously? So I had, I, I mean, I, I do look around quite a lot, but I do, I did, I have observed as well that like, there is quite a bit of tooling and there are tool chains out there. If you choose to kind of um, go your own path, maybe not use something like a commoditized service like Gremlin, hosted service like Gremlin. Um, it does take a bit of work. We did try this at work before we went and used Gremlin. We did try to set up a tool chain separately and see, see what the effort was. Um, but one thing I saw, saw was um, it uh, relies heavily on Java, like a lot of these services are Java-based, which isn't so good if you're running a, a node, pla a node uh, set of applications. Um, so, yeah, I guess one of my asks would be, like, please con contribute to the open source community, but it would be good to see other languages uh, being supported there a bit more as well. Um, yeah, like we would love to do more application level fault injection, but at the minute there, there, there isn't so much tooling there to support that. Uh, and I wanted to plug someone that I have been speaking to at this conference and is like a, a really sort of a, amazing writer on this subject and knows a lot about the subject. His name is Adrian, and he's a principal architect at AWS, and he wrote a lot about some of these things that you can do that have been open sourced. So there is something that AWS has, which is called the System Manager, which you can go in and you can actually run chaos experiments uh, across different parts of your stack. All kinds of things like kill switches, infrastructure attacks, um, DNS, there's lots of different attacks. Uh, and this is something you can do if you're running on AWS that I think isn't that, I wanted to bring it up because it's not that well exposed. I didn't even know about it until yesterday or today. And I think this is great because this allows us to do the kind of attacks, uh, you know, programmatically uh, through our own teams. 
And actually, I've been told as well, you can run it on a container and other clouds as well. It doesn't have to be just AWS. But yeah, do find Adrian. He is here somewhere today. Um, yeah. And this is one of my last slides. So I guess for me, like, I think it was great to hear Gremlin announce their um, scenarios, because this is kind of how I'd like to see things move as well, is being able to run a multi-vector attack. Because again, like the root cause fallacy, like there usually isn't a single root cause. It's normally like maybe something happened, uh, maybe there was a gradual memory leak in your application which caused you know, a knock-on effect somewhere else and then it caused another effect over here. And actually what you wanna see is like maybe doing something like this, kind of you know, hitting lots of things. Uh, you know, either you know, uh, linearly or all at the same time, just concurrently, and seeing what happens, basically. But also to be able to do this in a really more random way, because I think the problem that we often have with chaos engineering is that in order to create experiments, they're fairly contrived. You have to imagine what could happen up front. But is that true to experience? Like, usually the point in chaos is that it's fundamentally surprising to us. We think that we have risk under control. We think that we know what could fail. But usually in an incident, it's surprising. That's the nature of it. It should be surprising. Um, or you know, even the, the near misses, they say to pay attention to near misses as well, where you're like, that could have blown up into something really big. Uh, but I do think like we need to get to a point where we can evolve this to be very um, sort of yeah, randomly generated or stochastic, as they say. And this is my last slide, so it, <laughs> anytime you hear this song again, I hope this is what you hear, it's stochastic, it's fantastic. But yeah, um, <laughs> and yeah, I think that's it for me. So yeah, thank you.